Watchtower claims that they were completely exonerated at the end of the war after they were released from prison. On November 11th, 1918, the World War ended. Prisoners of war were being released. Rutherford and his associates were not. It appeared that their opponents had succeeded. The Bible students circulated a petition for the release of the eight men and obtained 700,000 signatures. On March 12, 1919, Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, conceded that the prison terms were excessive. On March 26th, all eight men were released. The charges were later dropped. But the Lord was preparing them for the future. It was going to be a battle with the political, religious, and commercial world, and Brother Rutherford was uh, geared and trained for that after he got out. So you mean this part isn't true either? Let's so fact check they, our history. Let's check it out. Okay, it's, it's been embellished on why they went to jail. Now it's been embellished why they were exonerated. Well, were they exonerated? This is the question. Uh, Let's fact check the history. Let's look it up. So I actually talked to an attorney friend of mine, and he was able to download for me the writ of error, the, the, uh, the appeal. And... I found it quite fascinating. It was very interesting. So, And for the record, he never saw it before, so it's not a premeditated no, yeah. <laughs> scheme <laughs> yeah. on, on Watchtower history part. You know, this, uh, I, I literally just read this today. This is new documentation I did not have. Not and I particular... haven't seen it yet prior to this. <laughs> this came, like he said, at the last minute. So this is new to me. I'm, I'm hearing this with you. So what were the exact charges? Brought against Watchtower and what are Watchtower's claims? Before we get to that, Watchtower claims they were exonerated of false charges. So far, we haven't seen any false charges. So what were they exonerated of? Or were they even exonerated? Watchtower doesn't provide any evidence for it. So here is this article. And this is Clayton Woodworth in his older years. And he's talking about, you know, these these particular things, his story, and he claims they were completely exonerated. So let's fact check the history. Let's see what the documentation says. What does the United States court record say? So let's take a look here in just a moment. In, in the June 1st, 1920 Watchtower, on the inside cover, it says the prosecution ended. So they said that in May 1919, the Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the judgment announcing a fair trial was not given to them. They were still held under the original indictment to appear in the district court. Five times thereafter, they were required to appear until the 5th of May, 1920, when the cases were dismissed. Dismissed isn't an exoneration. There's no exoneration mentioned here, right? So Watchtower's printed opinion here is that the trial was unfair and illegal. Imprisonment for nine months was illegal as the appellate court decided. Well, did the appellate court decide that? We have that document. We're going to take a look. So, dismissal on the case, on the motion of the district attorney, is an exoneration of the brethren. This is their claim. They're claiming the exoneration. What was the district attorney's opinion? Was there an exoneration? What really happened? They make this same claim in the Revelation its grand climax at hand. And it says, they were sent to prison on June 22nd, 1918, most of them with 20-year sentences. They were released on bail nine months later. On May 14th, 1919, the appeal court reversed their erroneous convictions. They were shown to be 130 errors in the trial. Roman Catholic Judge Manton, a knight of the Order of St. Gregory the Great, who in 1918 had refused bail to these Christians, was sentenced later in 1939 to two years imprisonment in a fine of $10,000 on six charges of soliciting and accepting bribes. Now they're Which part of that in, is true? Which part of that is true? 
Well, the second part is probably <laughs> true. <laughs> um, but once again, they're trying to tie in two events as if they're the judge's corruption yeah. was why the they were arrested and convicted and, and all that and sentenced. Yeah, and that that yeah, they're they're okay, building another narrative. Corrupt, yeah, you yeah. could be a corrupt judge on on something over here, but but have. Uh, judged correctly by law something else. So the yes. two should be separated. That statement could be completely right. erased. Exactly. And, and, and you know, it's true, right? In 1939, this did happen. Here's newspaper articles and photos of this judge being taken away, right? He was corrupted then. But was there any corruption that you can prove from the court transcript, like you said. And one, the case yeah, yeah, was just, developed by the judge. It was brought already before and put together before it yeah. even got to him. So he did not corrupt the, the what Rutherford and all them did. He just uh, ruled on the case. So he had nothing to do with evidence or, or anything right. submitted to the court in this case. So we're going to see, we with this new document, which we haven't got to yet, we're almost there. We're going to see why was the case tossed out. We'll see if it was an exoneration or not. We'll actually see if there are 130 errors that the court agreed to as well. Watchtower filed for writ of error. And they had to wait for the case to be retried. It was never really retried after the war was over. So what actually transpired is that the convicted defendants filed a petition for writ of error. And that's the first pages in the trial transcript. And what is a writ of error? It's basically directed to the judge of a court record in which the final judgment has already been given and commanding them in some cases to examine the record and send it to another court to see if there are any alleged errors in it, right? So that's in what a writ word, of error is. In other words, a long story short, make this go away. Yeah, legally, yeah. without breaking yeah. the law, just ma make yeah. this go away. We're not gonna, we're not gonna convict. We're not gonna let anyone off scot free. Just let, let's yeah. make it go just away. Forget about it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That that's yeah. the best way to to say. Yeah. It. There's an interesting post on Jehovah's Witness dot com, which I thought really helped clarify this particular issue. It suggests the writ of error was allowed by the trial court, Judge Howe and granted by the district court Judge Chatfield, whom the society earlier objected to and removed from their trial because he felt he wouldn't be fair to them. So what does this mean? It, you know, during the course of any trial, the defense attorney will take exceptions and objections and note any errors in procedure and practices customary to common law. If the defendants lose and are convicted, the defense attorney can use these errors as a basis for appeal. So Judge Howe, who presided over the trial of Rutherford and his co-defendants, is being very generous here. Not like Watchtower is claiming, right? He's being very generous to note the defense's objections and exceptions, and openly stating in court several times that he would act to preserve the rights of the defendants and acknowledge that they could make appeals. What this could have done is they could have did a retrial for it, right? The convicts are still guilty. But basically, the trial errors mean that the procedures could be corrected and retried. They just basically, it got to the point where they didn't say if they're guilty or innocent, you just forget about it. Let's see why. And, and, and provided they're released <laughs> and do nothing about it on top of it. So there, yeah. there, there's more to all this. It reminds me of a case that um, happened that I read about a few years back where two best friends... Um, went out drinking and driving together and the one uh, friend drove drunk and killed the other guy's son. Okay. The father had the opportunity to press charges for manslaughter based on, on all the conditions and circumstance, but, but chose not to. And, and basic reasoning for that was, Hey, my son did the same thing. He was involved in it. They grew up together. I don't want to hurt these guys. This guy's been like a son. It was two boys being stupid. It could have happened the other way around. Anyway, let it go. Just let it go. And yeah. the court wasn't insisting, no, press press charge. They don't care. 
Yeah. What, what the people don't understand, the court doesn't care. The court cares what the two opposing sides feel. Yeah. If either one of them let it, let it go, they're like, oh, you okay with it? You okay? Okay. Here you go. Have at it. So that that's really kind of rid of her in, in a lot of the circumstances um, in this same case right here were. Well, this Judge Howe that we were just talking about, right? We have a Western Union telegram that was sent from him to Rutherford. And in this, he basically said, and this is from it's uh, Rutherford's uh, lawyers stating what Judge Howe said. So Judge Howe plainly states that the Bible students did much damage and may not deserve to be set free. And yet he's being very cordial, right? This was sent a couple weeks before the release. So how did they get released? The Watchtower lawyers sent a letter stating that the appeal was taken. And this was on January 29th, 1919. So what followed and why? All right, so here's the new documentation that we just got. This is the Circuit Court of Appeals, the Second Circuit Court, Rutherford versus the United States. And we will take a look and see why this was forgotten about. Were they exonerated of all charges? Were there false charges? Let's read the record and see what it says. Basically, it looks like, from this evidence, that the whole thing is thrown out because of technicalities with the trial. There's no proof of innocence here at all. And in these several pages, I cannot count 130 errors. There's basically two. Or basically two stories, two narratives that they're talking about that encourage the... There's three judges that ruled on it. Two voted to forget about it, and one decided not to. And, and we'll look at that in just a moment. So the evidence is that they were not exonerated at all. So in this first clipping, it says that the witnesses, these are Bible students, Watchtower followers, that are being put on the court to testify about the matter. To try and, They were trying to get evidence from them in, in interrogating them on the sand. Except they weren't very helpful at all. And actually, they got themselves into some trouble, too. So the witnesses, Mr. and Mrs. Hudgens, were not forthtelling in their testimony. Mrs. Hudgens couldn't or wouldn't identify the rubber stamp Rutherford used. Mrs. Hudgens couldn't or wouldn't identify the rubber stamp Rutherford used, or even if a letter she wrote was dictated by Van Amberg. This is something she would have known. She just refused to answer, right? In the second clipping, the court recognized she was being evasive in answering the questions. So was this the first on-record example of theocratic <laughs> warfare when the... <laughs> <laughs> when the authorities are coming and you're supposed to lie for Jehovah, it was, could you say this is the first example that this ever happened? Well, they are definitely uh, perjured here on, on the stand. So I couldn't say it's the first, I, you know, hard to tell, but it's a definitely a good earliest. clear example, right? One of the earliest. One of the earliest, yeah. <laughs> so so the, the court, you know, as I said, the court recognizes clipping three. Watchtower's defense was that they were they were asking that for a mistrial because and a withdrawal of a juror because of this. Basically, Watchtower is asking for a mistrial and, and to get rid of a juror because of this. It's because Mrs. Hudgens wouldn't answer a question. It's very bizarre reasoning. It doesn't make any sense. It seems to be like that they were trying to drag drag the the court on, you know, so they didn't fall for it. So clipping four, Mr. Hudgens was also evasive in his answers. 
this wasn't helpful at all for Watchtower's case. Yet these are the technicalities with which Watchtower is requesting to have the matter thrown out of court. Rutherford's signature was used everywhere. Hudgens probably even had it in his birthday book. Remember, I was flipping through my mana when we were doing that discussion. I was like, oh, I didn't know I had his signature. And for the viewers, there, <laughs> there's a Makes reason why we're going through all the history. <laughs> oh. I just saw J.F. Rutherford in here. <laughs> You're kidding. No. Hold on. Don't tell me you have his book. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> hey, uh, oh, yeah, here it is. He autographed it. Yep. Did you know this? No, I did not until now. Literally, this moment is the first I saw it. And I've looked through it before and never is thought that about his, it. Is that matching his other? Yeah, it does. It does. If you remember our discussion, some of the Rutherford signatures, one of them being in the mana here, including his wife, Mary. Okay, okay. And then the other ones are from the death threat letters. Check out our discussion on when Watchtower celebrated birthdays. It's very interesting. They're lying. Everyone knew Rutherford's signature. It was on all the documents everywhere. They're just refusing to answer. This one's a little strange. Watchtower asked a couple of times to remove a juror. 